Hi everyone, Mick Lubinskis here for Navitas Ventures uh, and I'm joined by Lan Snell. Hey Lan, how are you doing? Good, thank you. And um, Lan and I know each other from uh, way back. We've done a little bit of work in Sydney and uh, you actually knew my wife and uh, we stayed in touch and you have some strong opinions, ideas, actions and wildness around the world of education and we're going to have a discussion about it and, and in the 12 second preamble we got right into the heart of it which is education is absolutely ripe for disruption that's right so tell why do you think that okay so this is where i sort of have to complete that sentence for you right yeah, exactly. so, <laughs> so it is completely it's one sector that i think is on so many dimensions completely right for disruption i think that has been by and large the attraction for many people in the in the ed tech space oh my goodness there's so many pain points everywhere you look across all the all the journeys that there's pain points from the student perspective from the back end systems from you know every angle there is pain there um and so that represents great opportunity but i'm going to take one step further back from that and and just contextualise this conversation about some of the observations that we've been seeing in um, the ed sector. I mean, I work for a university, particularly in the post-experience um, space, so postgraduate space. And some of the more common observations that we're seeing in the labour market is like obviously change. Change is a constant thing that happens throughout. But the way it's impacting organisations on triple dimensions, on an organisational structure perspective, on the workers themselves, the nature of work, and the workers themselves. So there's impact on all across those things this has parallel impact on all the augmented um, services around that education is a key part of that so the challenge for us is how might we actually respond to those challenges and the first question that we need to ask is what is industry wanting at this stage and it seems almost I don't know about you, Mick, um, but every time I open LinkedIn or whatever, there's some sort of salient piece about what hiring expectations look like, what are the right skill sets and capabilities and stuff like that. So we can come to some, some common denominator things that we can cluster together. It seems quite apparent that people are looking for, the assumption is that they have to have a domain of expertise there, right? This, I'm talking about the experienced hires market, not the fresh at a uni sort of thing. There's a domain of expertise that is assumed. Nothing can replace it. So, for example, I'm an engineer, I'm an accountant, I'm a whatever. But increasingly these days, it's not enough. And the reason why it's not enough is because the organisations are changing. So no longer really are they those typical hierarchical siloed um, organisations. Sure, they still exist. But increasingly what it looks like is more matrix based, more group composition, more project led, right? So it's a bit more messy. There's a number of different verticals and horizontals happening here. And I think from my observations in working with industries that they're hiring based on group composition or project composition. So that means a different and diverse team set coming into it. So I'm looking for an engineer, I'm looking for a designer, I'm looking for a, a CX, I'm looking for whatever it is, a, di a different um, match. And so that domain of expertise still applies, but above that is what we call a more enterprise or generalist layer there. So it looks like this, a T effect, we put the magic T. And increasingly it's going from T to X as well, because there's you know, obviously the X factor, but how do you actually collaborate? How do you work in a more, with a more agile mindset? How do you actually open up your way of thinking to a more um, cultural and be culturally and globally competent, which is actually a dimension that is missing, particularly for Australia, is very inclusive. They need to be a bit more um, outward looking rather than inward looking. And that's a criticism that I commonly hear. I mean, Australia is a partner that we work closely with as well. So that's one of the criticisms. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the general observations that we're seeing. And so, you know, the, the questions that we ask is, okay, how do we respond to that? And that is um, the other criticism, sorry, that we get for universities. Are, you're kind of like outdated now, man. You know, all the programs are irrelevant, uh, lacking currency and relevancy. Mm. It's hard to argue with that, right? And the reason why universities have been perceived that, that way is because by the time it takes t um, you to think about a new idea, you have to set up like 10 million committees, Mick, and then internally, and then by the time you bring that to market, that's two years out, and by that time that benefit is realised, you add another five, uh, three years, and that's a five-year realisation period, right? Well, the whole world changes in that period. Mm. 
So I guess there's, I don't know about you, but I still think that there's some saliency um, with qualifications, okay? But it looks like this. It's not just one thing. It looks like different sizes and different shapes of products. When I said products, learning experiences, interaction. Yep. yep. Um, so yeah. we call this lifelong learning. I don't know what the, what, what you, your thoughts about this are. Yeah, I, well, I think certainly um, the old adage of whether it's an apprenticeship or... Uh, or university degree um, that you largely do a body of learning and then you go and work and you might do some minor adjustments along the way. Right. Um, but, um, but you, um, yeah, largely you, you get it done in a big bulk and then you, you, you go. Yeah. To place. Um, and I think, that's right. um, and I think that's very di difficult. I, I, I find it hard to um, com completely understand it because I was, self-taught with computers before I got to uni and mm. I, I knew, I felt I knew so much that I didn't bother doing computer science. I went and did business cause I was like, that's an area I don't know. But then I missed out on some chunks of computer science and I don't have that backing. And so that has been different for me, like in some good, some bad. Um, but absolutely. I have always been a person who read a lot of books and now I have a big mix of books, podcasts, online learning, uh, conferences, etc. But um, it, al it always struck me as interesting that when I was working in a job, I, if I was playing um, a high level of basketball, I'd train twice a week. Uh, I remember once I was training um, like maybe six to eight hours a week for one two hour game. And, and you think about work, you do, you're there for, let's say you're there for 40 hours and yeah. maybe, maybe you do. Yeah. Maybe you effectively do an hour a week. I know, Mick, I've lost you. Oh. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're frozen. Oh, you're back again. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're frozen too. Okay, yeah, yeah. My, it says my internet connection is unstable. Here I am in Silicon Valley, and I have an unstable internet connection. <laughs> um, luckily, Zoom being a unicorn now can fix that for us. So, yeah, I, I think that, that is an interesting uh, thing that I think you have to absolutely get to more of that. Because my... my career and life has been wonderfully diverse and I've learned along the way, but I, I think I've been very, very, very lucky and fortunate, but also worked hard. Um, the other thing I find really interesting is that the feedback loops are slow but in, in all respects. So um, if you do something now for the next cohort of people coming through and like, okay, maybe in, in Australia, four years time, they're in the workforce, and that's like it's that's when the rubber hits the road, right? It's like, yeah. am I attractive enough? Did I do a good job? But then actually, you're like, oh, if you learn something from that and you go back and apply it, it takes another four years to get it out. Um, now, I always wondered whether there's an opportunity with universities to say, okay, this is actually a um, you you subscribe to our university, and it's actually uh, ten years, or it's just ongoing. It's yearly, right? And you do. Some work, some some learning, some work, some learning, some work. It's much more integrated, so that the the laps are much faster. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness, you've mentioned so many things there. I mean, I'm going to just try and um, the couple of things that you mentioned at the front end include things such as you know the whole um, learning up front. We I, I kind of like to call that the front loaded model of education. And it's, it, it's spot on. So, you know, we're born as human beings. We go through primary school, we go through school, and generally high school, whatever, and then we go to university, go to work, and then we die, sort of thing. And all our learning is front-loaded there. But that whole narrative of the future work demands constant learning. So it's not this linear journey. It's going back. Those feedback loops are there. But the infrastructure at the moment doesn't support that. It's getting better because now we have new entrants into the market and so that is the prevalence now and the growth of learning platforms that are disrupting the way um, that these shapes and sizes of learning looks like. So when we think about the number of open courses available, the short courses available, micro-credentials onto the... So it's basically a menued um, offering of different sizes and shapes of learning to suit your personal and or professional wherever you are with that. You mentioned your own learning journey that looks anything but typical. And I think that that, that now is the typical model because there's no such thing as what a normal progression is because our work is disrupted in so many ways. We don't know what that new emerging technology is coming in. We can't be versed with that, but we do know that we can tap back in. The last point that you mentioned um, about the subscription model, 
I think this is the current challenge that all providers are looking at, whether a university or a learning platform, is that how might we encourage that loyalty behaviour to come back, come the subscription model. And hence, I like to call this almost like the Edflix model, right? So the, we now understand the Netflix model of that. And they do a great job. It will, the AI works very well in terms of predictive of what we like based on what we've viewed, our predictive um, behaviour. In a similar way, we should be able to sort of anticipate because we're the, um, we're the research engines, right? We should anticipate what these trends are in terms of the next, um, the next sort of um, cyber security, the next sort of sort of trend in learning. We should be able to bring those uh, products to the market quite quickly and offer those um, emergent um, technologies to students as a subscription buyer basically and get them to come back to their alma mater but this is not just us doing it this should be us doing it in an ecosystem of different of industry players of and collaborating with different learning platforms so it's not just a university-led solution I think that the future of education is a very collaborative ecosystem Wow, yeah, it's, um, you've said a lot there, I need to unpack as well. So, yeah, I think there's tremendous opportunity and I, I actually think that there is um, still tremendous value in um, proximity. Uh, I think it's changing, you know, uh, I think the uh, blended, mixed, whatever, where um, you have do things online, but I think there is a tremendous opportunity for universities to to have it as a home base of learning, I think to there's something deliberate about it. Mm. I, I know for me, like uh, in terms of if I think about it, like health, um, if if I can either go for go to the gym or go go to um, go surfing, I'm, I might go. But if I've actually got a soccer game planned where there's a team and it's a time that I'm much more like and a place to go, uh, you know, it's more deliberate. So I, I think having some tangibility around it actually still adds a lot of value. Um, and I, 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 and I, you know, I think it's, um, uh, but I think that, it, that there is so many opportunities to, to, to make it about lifetime learning and to, to change the model. But it's hard because it, there, there is so much grounded in it and there's so much people are sort of used to it. But um, I think the, it, the, the big question is which university is going to be bold enough to do some experiments, you know, which are going to say, you know, um, uh, you know, very small world today. I was um, interviewing a lady that my brother introduced me to, um, a woman from Kenya, and um, she went through Minerva. Um, yes. if, you know, I know you're familiar with Minerva, and I know Robin Gobber really well. Um, I mean, and they started with the technology side to create something really engaging and, and got a bit of a different model, but I think that's uh, obviously starting from scratch, then you've got complete flexibility. Um, it's the innovator's dilemma as it applies to universities is still absolutely there, which is, um, and it's not even just the universities, it's like in Australia, there's 13 years of schooling and same with America, that bringing you towards this moment. And, uh, but I think there is a real opportunity to say, you know what, for, for 10 kids, for 50, 50 kids, um, we're going to try this model and say, hey, let's, let's do a mix. Let's get one teacher, one subject, one, I, I, I I don't know. I went to ASU GSV, and I didn't. I don't know. There's, you know, ASU obviously uh, is doing some experimentation, and there's a lot of universities doing. You know, you know Harvard put their a lot of their courses online and things like that, and their content. But where's the real experimentation around the model? Like, I think it's still, it's still ripe for disruption. But I still think it's. I don't know. It still feels like 1999 for education technology. It's not like there's not this. Uh, there's a groundswell and I, and I think the benefit is bigger than almost anything because even if you think about health and climate change and the environment as being very, very important um, things to, to improve, if you solve education, it's the multiplier for all of them. You know, yeah. it, st it stops crime, it stops poverty, it doesn't stop them. Again, again I'm, I'm coming from a very, very privileged position, but it really helps. So, yeah, I... I I, but I don't get a sense that, uh, you know, the um, Lambda school, that was interesting. It's like, okay, it's free and we'll take it, take it out of your money. And I hear some people complaining. You're like, you're getting a free education and, and get a, getting an increased salary and you're paying it out. Like, that's an amazing model. Like, how can you question that? Mm. Um, and Minerva, but I mean, are you seeing any other, are you seeing, and has your university got some opportunity to experiment? 
Yes, we do. We're in a, in a fairly lucky position at the moment. Let me, let me get to that in a minute because we are. I'm operating in the sandpit area where, and I will share with you that experimentation. But I wanted to just touch on a point that you mentioned earlier, and that was there is a lot of stuff on the market, Mick, as you know. But the, 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 the thing that's missing for a lot of people is because we don't know what we don't know, we don't know. I mean, there's, we, we do know that there's a lot of bad product out there as well. So for us, the challenge for us is how do we assure for that learning? You know, how, how do we can say, we've got to put our hand on our heart and say, look, you've been enrolled in one of our programs that we will, these are the outcomes that we're looking at. And that's, and so that's that assurance of learning is there because we're a university provider. We have to make sure that we do that. So that's something to keep in mind. So that speaks to the quality of the product, right? The second bit is about our ability to experiment and bring in, um, and this touches on the first point about the cultural, uh, the lack of inertia within universities. However, having said that, I guess we're in a particular space I work for Macquarie Business School Macquarie University Business School and um, I work in the MBA portfolio and so we've been able to come to market with a very I believe truly innovative program where it has three points of difference and most MBAs if you listen to their pitches because I often do this I go in as a mystery shopper myself and pretend I'm a student and you know just blend right in and listen to their pitch and everyone else everyone will say oh we're future focused. Well, if they're not, they're dead in the water already because it is about outcomes. It's about outcomes rather than, oh, we're going to teach you accounting and finance. And they're important. Don't get me wrong, but it's the outcome, the ability to be literate, the ability to be, have some sort of financial literacy, to have digital literacy. That's the outcome that we're pursuing here. So the language has to match what industry expectation is here. So future focus capabilities is um, a curriculum approach that is our first point of difference. So we had the opportunity to build that from this ground up. So like Minerva, um, you know, that gives us a bit of freedom in that respect in that we're not shackled or chained to an old model. We had complete scope to actually re-engineer what we thought the future of education could look like in an MBA space. So how we did that was we looked at, um, we worked very closely with industry and asked them what their hiring expectation is and mapped it to a number of different sources, um, including the World Economic Forum, which outlined 16 key future focus capabilities. So I'm talking about things such as the ability to think strategically, the ability to be adaptable, um, to have a growth mindset, to have agility in thinking, um, the analyzing um, abilities. So those type of um, soft skills, if you like, but they're in nothing, anything but soft. So we've come up with six specialisations that form these future focus capabilities. That's the first point. The second point of difference relates to the actual model. So we, as I said earlier, we believe that this is a partnership approach, an ecosystem, building an ecosystem. We can't do this on our own. So we partnered with the uh, one of the world leaders in terms of learning uh, platforms, and that's Coursera. You may be familiar with them. So they're based in the US. So when we look at the market, that you know, Coursera is one of the leaders. edX is another leader. I don't need to tell you this. You know, already know. They've got already 40 million uh, open learners out there, from which for us represents right. a fantastic funnel, right? So um, I call this stackable. Um, this is the second point of difference. It's our stackable approach to what we offer. So here's what I'm talking about. We offer one of the options is obviously the masters of uh, the, the MBA, right? But there are a number of other options before you can get to that. And they're not linear as well. So don't think this is a linear progression. It could be, you might just be interested in open stuff because you just want, a, you know, a taster for it. You might want to actually pursue and get subscribed to Coursera because you want a digital badge. That's fantastic. Or you might want to enroll in a single unit or indeed the whole master. So it's a stackable approach to learning and it's not linear. So you can dip in and dip out as where you go. The third point of difference is what I call the actual disruptor in terms of the price point. So this is now pursuing very deliberately our strategy of a democratised model of education or distributed approach. This is about taking accessibility beyond geographic boundaries and it's only possible through a digital delivery. This is where we get the scale. So I'm talking about bringing an MBA to market at 33,000 Australian or 20,000 US, right? So that's a, it's a market disruptor, I think, because it's a, we are the top three business school in Australia. We have a very um, uh, uh, international brand. We are in the top 
uh, 100 in FT rankings. And so we're not going to mess around with our reputation by bringing to market a nasty or perceived nasty cheap product. It's anything but that. So it's a full on MBA um, coming into the market at 20,000 US dollars, but all those things available. So those three points of difference, I believe make it tr truly unique. I know the space quite well now. And whilst everyone's saying that, oh, our program is about future focus skills, that's great. But tell me about the learning um, options for students. Tell me about how you're actually going to make this uh, uh, large scale. So we're seeking scale here. Interesting. It's, um, so when I ever hear, I've never done an MBA. I've been curious at times. I kind of think I'm constantly, I'm, you know, I see 20 or 30 new companies a year and I work with them and I'm learning so fast by doing. Yeah. Um, but I, I do, do recognise that there are, um, there are gaps in my knowledge and I try to fill it with books, but it's not the same. But one of the big things that people talk to me about the big value of an MBA uh, is the cohort. Um, yes. And so how, how is the cohort value going with, with the, the digital and the personal? Because a, a quick aside, um, in, the first, in the first cohort of Muru D, um, the, the, they were getting along quite well. Then we took them to the US and we, ha we had a couple of nights out and we had a couple of out at nights socialising and a lot more breakfast. Like it was, we were in a different place and we had a few drinks occasionally. And when they came back, it was triple the amount of um, yes. cohesion and community. Um, so um, and the, the, ne the next year, we actually did a offsite in the first two weeks to, to, and it worked. It basically set up the relationships much stronger. Um, and it's true. Like it's... Um, yes. It, it, if you... I think if I've, um, you know, you and I have known each other long enough, we can jump on a phone and have a chat and, and, and roll on. We don't need to get past formalities, but if we wanted to, to maintain the relationship, there has to be some face-to-face. -face. So how, how, are, how are you thinking about addressing that? Is it, is it actually still real or is that changing as well? Is that millennials don't care about that or is that still about no, I think that's still very much valid. And there's, I don't think anyone takes away from the, the benefits of that face-to-face -face interaction, that socialisation that um, happens in, in that space. No, nothing can replace it. This virtual interaction here, it's, we still feel close and stuff like that. But once we get together, it's a, you're right, completely different dimension. So let's just think about our profile, our, our, our students here. So our students are looking for um, a premium quality um, business school. They're looking for quality product. But these are busy professionals. They're not able to come on campus because they're travelling a lot. They've got family obligations, blah, blah, blah. And they should not be denied the opportunity to do the, pursue the MBA. So that's first and foremost what we're providing, meeting that pain gap. When we look at the cohort that we've got, our first intake happened uh, seven weeks ago. So we had two intakes a year. Um, and we got 70 students on board. And the average age is 38 so these we're talking about senior level professionals coming in here from uh, the first cohort is from 14 different countries so it's not dependent on one or two rivers of gold so to speak it's certainly a spread so we've got a cluster from in canada a cluster in Myanmar, um, in the states in south africa so they're all over the place so you've got people from virgin Qantas who are traveling leaders um you know so that gives you a bit of an understanding and the average age is 38 years old so these are seasoned professionals right getting to your point about the lack of face-to-face -face interaction and does does that bring a different dimension of community? Well, I, I think it does, but the way we work around it is a number of things. First of all, we've um, availed different collaboration tools for um, our students. And so they collaborate through, obviously, Zoom. So Zoom is a, a, the main platform. And so we're, they're having very similar discussions like you are and I are having right now. And we also use Slack as well for that immediacy in terms of how they interact with each other as a group. Um, because these are seasoned professionals, they're very used to different dark time zones as well. And that can also be a mediate in how, in how we sort of interact. But that's the nature of business these days, right? And we're, we're working, you're in San Francisco. I don't know what time it is there at the moment for you, but it's, it's Sydney time. It's like, you know, 1 p.m. for us. So we find ways to make that work. But that community building is still very much there. One of the first points of feedback that I'm getting from students is, well, I had no idea it would be like this. Yeah. My idea of based at, um, online learning is PDF distant. It's, it's pretty ordinary. And that's the case for the majority of learning experiences. But with ours through the community of community infrastructure that we build, it's much closer for them, right? It's a completely different feeling. 
But I have to say to you that the thing that kicks in is what we call the augmented layer of service, and this is about the local meetups. So because we have students all around the, um, the world, key markets, I'm about to head off to a big trip around Southeast Asia, Mick, and what am I going to do is meet up with our students. Right. So we have these meetup areas there where that we can get together, they get to meet faculty, but then they also get to meet each other. It's not compulsory, um, but it's certainly another nice dimension for them to feel that layer connect connectedness. But that community spirit is coming right through right now. When you know, I look through all the Slack channels that they've created and, and the level of engagement is second to none. It's fantastic, that interaction. Wow, well, okay, that's great. Uh, really interesting. Um, and we've covered a lot of ground and we've, we've, we're past the half hour mark uh, for our meeting, so we're getting close to that now. So yeah. um, what I would love to know, just to finish off, is there any technology, education technology, that you've seen recently which has gone made you go wow so yeah i mean i i do often go to these ed tech sort of uh, conferences and you know there's a lot lots of on the student learning experience that are quite um interesting and a lot of that is to do with the, either um to you mentioned the feedback loops earlier and so we have a problem with you know trying to Get that immediacy of feedback and also peer review sort of I think that's really interesting and and I've seen some ed tech startups actually coming from universities addressing that pain point and I think that's going to be something to watch out for the other thing I think is really interesting is captioning so um, as increasingly universities are getting more digital in developing their capabilities across um, uh, this, the university the need to have live captioning and to search that functionality is really taking it to the next level now so any um, online recording we have we put out there published has to be captioned right so that's a um, um, uh, was a compliance thing that we have to sort of fulfill but there's beyond that compliance thing is how do we make that and maximize that as a learning experience for students and obviously people will watch videos or content and that they get value out of and, and, and perform searches on terms so that search technology I think is going to be interesting it takes it to a different level and the audio levels taking it so um, I won't mention the name of the firm that I've been talking to on that but I found that um, a very scalable model there wow. Cool, interesting. Len, lovely. That's a, we covered a wide gamut of conversations around education technology. And I think we bring it back right to the start. It's um, it's not just ripe for a disruption, but I think... I it, know, you froze me again. Oh. oh. No, I'm not frozen. <laughs> um, my internet connection isn't stable. Come on, Silicon Valley. I'm moving, yeah, back, to Australia. I'm moving back to Australia for the MBN. Yeah, no, don't, don't. But let's go to India. <laughs> India's pretty good. Vietnam's pretty good too. <laughs> <sighs> Let's decide that one. Okay, but back to the important thing. It is ripe and it is important that it is disrupted. And that's not because teachers aren't doing a good job or administrators aren't doing a good job. That'd be the same thing as to say that, you know, ca taxi drivers aren't good, nice people. It's yeah. like everything has to go through change and that's how things dramatically improve. They get stable and that's good for a period, but you've got to be prepared to change it up. And I really hope that... Um, that it, um, that we ha make some big strides. I've got a four-year-old, six-year-old, and eight-year-old, and, and honestly, I, I really hope university is massively different by the time I get to, um, uh, by, that, by the time they get there, because um, it's it, different and better. Like, you know, and you've still got a massively role for, important role for, for teachers and lecturers and administrators and, and everybody, but it's, um, you know, I, hopefully it's gone to the next level. Yeah, same here, same here. We'll, we'll try our best, Mick. Yeah, exactly. High expectations. <laughs> Look, my son's going to be starting high school soon, so, you know, you've got a, got a few years. Um, Len, thank you so much for your time and sharing your big ideas, and um, congratulations for doing that experiment. That MBA sounds really, really interesting. Um, wonderful connect, and hopefully we can connect face-to-face -face and learn from each other yet again, uh, again sometime soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thank you very much, Mick. Thanks.